Hi folks, I'm Gene Del Sala, president of Audioholics, and we are here today with... Hugo Rivera, vice president of marketing. How are you today, Gene? Doing great as always, Hugo. Awesome. Let's go ahead and today cover the great topic of amplifier measurements. You know, that's a great topic to discuss, and I'm glad you brought that up. And if I may, I'm going to plug the Audioholics amplifier measurement standard, because we put a lot of effort into accurately measuring amplifiers, and there's a reason for that. Do you, want to ask, do you want to know why? Why would that be, Gene? Well, as we do with pretty much everything in the industry, we look for deficiencies and we try to improve upon those deficiencies when we do our own tests. And nobody's perfect, of course. We're not perfect. But I am an engineer. I'm a degreed electrical engineer. I've designed amplifiers for a living in the telecom industry that we mm -hmm. work together in. And I saw there was a lacking standard and the way people were measuring amplifiers was pretty incomplete. Right. It didn't tell the whole picture. So, you know, I worked with these fine folks at Audio Precision. We're very happy to be working with Audio Precision. In fact, when I saw out the most accurate test gear to measure amplifiers, it was always Audio Precision. Right. So we hooked up with them. They supplied us with the HDMI APX A585 analyzer, and it is the most accurate audio analyzer in the industry. It's an eight channel, so we can measure one to eight channels. We could test HDMI inputs of receivers, but more importantly, we do all of our audio measurements, our power measurements, distortion, you name it, mm -hmm. all in here. And we have our screen captures, we have our graphics, we do our analysis, we can even import the data if we want to do any math, whether you do it in MATLAB or MathCAD or Excel. And now that I have this jacked equipment, <laughs> we needed to come up with a test commensurate exactly. with such equipment. Yeah. Absolutely. So I spent a little time, I did a little research, and I looked online, and I saw what everyone was doing with measurements, and most of the print magazines were simply doing a one kilohertz. One kilohertz, yeah. One kilohertz sweep test. And that was it. Between that and they would do maybe, if you're lucky, signal to noise ratio to see how quiet the amp was. And they'd have one graph, and they're done. Sounds pretty one-dimensional to me. Very one-dimensional, because the one kilohertz sweep test, while it is somewhat useful, it could mask a lot of problems with amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So what we decided was we were gonna, when we power tested amplifiers, we were gonna do full bandwidth power tests, just like the FTC mandates for two channel audio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we applied the full bandwidth FTC method for eight ohm and for four ohm loads. We did the sweep tests like the magazines do because everybody loves an instant gratification number. Yes, like zero to 60 in a race car. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> on a perfect track with no wind, right? Ideal conditions. Ideal conditions. And we also do what's called the dynamic burst test, which is based on a CEA 2006 standard. That was actually adapted from the car audio industry and Audio Precision has that built in here. And it basically, closely simulates music dynamic peaks and crest mm -hmm. factors. And I really like that test because it could tell me a lot about an amplifier's power supply. Interesting. Okay, If an amplifier is designed with a lot of headroom in the power supply, you'll see a big change in power when you do this, when you do this test as opposed to the continuous test. Mm -hmm. And the amplifiers that aren't so dynamic with their power supplies will give a very close measurement between the burst test and the continuous test. Understood. So, you know, in order to do accurate measurements of power, you need some pretty good resistors. Too. Yes, I can see over <laughs> here some pretty anabolic resistors. Yeah, I mean, the, this is the standard resistor that most people use. You know, these little power resistors, the gold ones on a little heat sink. These are good to, you know, 250, maybe 500 watts. Mm -hmm. When you start going beyond that, uh, they start glowing and radiating yeah. and they sing. You're actually, <laughs> if you like American Idol, you put 500 watts of these things and you'll be an S-contestant. So, nice. so the problem when these resistors heat up, what happens mm -hmm. when resistors heat up? Well, that's it. You know, the resistance is no longer mm -hmm. constant. Correct. Okay. So thankfully, our friends at Emotiva were so generous. They gave us these mega resistors to test their mega power amplifiers. Now, you know, the Emotiva XPR1 that we measured is, will pump out two kilowatts into yeah. a four-ohm load. This bad boy will take it. Mm -hmm, for you sure. Need, you need a resistor <laughs> like this to test the power accurately. So, you know, we use this for the receivers. We use this for the big boys. The yeah. big, or as Emotiva would call it, the big dogs, okay? Yeah. So we have this with the uh, resistors. We've got good resistor platform. We use a 20-amp line. Now, a lot of the manufacturers 
and even a lot of the print magazines, they'll use, I'm not just saying print magazines, even some of the online magazines, there are very few of them that actually do any testing. They'll use what's called a variac to hold the line voltage constant. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you start pushing on that line to grab current to test high power is the line will sag. They'll crank it back up with a variac to get that voltage constant to 120 volts. Now there's pros and cons to that. The pro is, yes, you're keeping a constant voltage so you're not worrying about sagging the line, the rails inside the amplifier. But in reality, who's doing that in their house? When you right. plug your amplifier in the wall, you're not sitting there with a Varic. Oh, let me turn it up now because the power is up. We're listening to Muse. We're cranking the bass. Let me crank the Variac up. And let's just get rid of the 20 amp breaker. Let's use a 30 amp breaker. Or not use a breaker at all. Just bypass the fuse and keep sucking power until the nuclear power plant turns yeah, on. Yeah, there, there's no real world condition. It's not a real world. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. testing something in a vacuum. Yeah, right? exactly. So I don't believe in doing that for amplifier tests. I believe that I like to watch the, the, the voltage of the line. Mm -hmm. If I see it sagging, you know, more than two volts, if it goes down 118 from a nominal 120, I'll note it in my test report. It's very rare, unless mm -hmm. the amplifier is really that powerful. So I try not to do any type of um, variac adjustment because I want to test real world how right. people are using the amplifier. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Excellent. Well, that's much more complete than uh, what I've seen out there, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, and we do more than just amplifier power tests. You know, I, yes, it's great to have a lot of power, a lot of clean power, but it's very easy to trick power tests. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I have some amplifiers here is these are Class D amplifiers. This one is from D-Sonic. And this one's from IQ Audio. These guys are actually pretty impressive for Class D because we've tested a few duds in Class D yes, before. Yes, for sure. You know, we've had one of the amplifiers we tested was uh, from a Canadian product. <laughs> the frequency response would just go out of control at 20 kilohertz because they use a very poor mm -hmm. uh, post-filter feedback. And the thing would vary based on frequency response, right? Yeah. Well, even some of the older ICE modules that were implemented in the Pioneer receivers, which Incidentally, they don't use anymore. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't be able to deliver above three kilohertz of power at, at four ohms. And this was a design deficiency of the amplifier. And it was something that was missed in all the magazines. Mm -hmm. So you get all these magazines saying, oh my God, this new $1,000 Pioneer receiver has more power than a $5,000 amplifier. Well, yeah, with their very limited tests, kind of right. like how speaker tests are done with mm -hmm. some of these companies. Absolutely. They made these general statements that, you know, you got the next generation of amplifiers that are gonna blow everything away. Well, yes, if you test in a narrow bandwidth and actually don't use the product like it would be reused in a real world, Absolutely. you can make a false assumption like mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. So what we do again is we power sweep the full bandwidth. We look at distortion, not just at one kilohertz, but we do sweep of power versus frequency and we look at the distortion there. We look at doing FFT analysis, and what that does is you run either one kilohertz or you do multitone in sometimes, and you look at the harmonics that it generates, mm -hmm. and you want to see how clean that is, okay? The other thing we do is we look at signal-to-noise ratio. Now, a lot of amplifier companies will tell you, oh, we got 130 dB of SNR. Well, yeah, okay, is that at max power or is that at one watt? And the problem is if you got a 1,000-watt amplifier and it's giving you this spec versus uh, an amplifier that's 100 watts, someone might think that the 1,000-watt amplifier is quieter yeah. than the 100 watt amplifier. Mm -hmm. So what we do, it takes a little more work, is we test at max power and we test at one watt. And then we compare apples to apples. So we show you the SNR at one watt for all amplifiers so you can make an apples to apples comparison. Mm -hmm. We also either do A weighting, if it's a D class D amplifier that needs some filtering, or we do unweighted. And we always specify how the measurement is taken because right. You could fudge any measurement. Mm -hmm. You could, oh, yeah. with, frequent, with speakers, you could smooth the hell out of a measurement. You could change the vertical scale, so everything looks flat. If you go to a manufacturer's website and you look at a flat frequency response, how are the conditions of the test? Exactly. I think, I think this goes for any kind of uh, subject matter when it comes to science. You can take any test and manipulate it to go ahead and give you the result that you're looking for. Absolutely. So, so we try to pre-qualify. We don't change the conditions of the test. We don't do the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> <laughs> we qualify every measurement we make. We tell you how we make the measurements. We try to do them consistently for each product. Right. And we look beyond just power because power is very important. You know, people are into this all channels driven test. Yes. And I showed yes. you the article I wrote mm -hmm. on that. Great and article. that's another thing that's a, that's a kind of a very closed loop, mm -hmm. generalized kind of thing. It's not real world. You're basically taking an amplifier. You're giving it 
the best possible test load, which is a resistor, with the worst possible test signal, a constant tone. Mm -hmm. Nobody listens to music as a constant tone. No. If you put a one kilohertz tone through a speaker, beyond a few watts, you wouldn't be able to sit in the room. I'm sure. So, you know, you're not hearing a constant duty cycle when you're listening to music. So the all channels driven, I think, is merit to it in, in, in seeing the limitations of a power supply or how an amplifier company has protected the circuits of their power amp. Right. But I think burst testing, dynamic testing, once you go beyond two channels, is very important to look at. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, Yamaha used to get really beaten up on the forums, and I'm not trying to single out any particular company. We love Yamaha. But Yamaha engineers, the Japanese engineers, are very conservative people. They're all about safety. You know, they have the CE marks on the back of their receivers. They're all about not generating too much heat, about getting UL approval for four-ohm loads. Right. And what they do is when, when that amplifier senses more than four or five channels driven, mm -hmm. it automatically it, goes into protect. Yeah, it goes into protect. So, so you get all these people on the forum saying, oh, my God, the Yamaha receiver only delivers 38 watts a channel with seven channels driven. Yeah, well, that's not a real-world scenario. Meanwhile, you could crank the thing in a 6,000 cubic foot room and have theatrical levels out of this receiver. Yeah. So, obviously, this, the test condition is not appropriate for the right. product. Exactly. Okay? So, we look at the all channels driven. We qualify whether or not that's an appropriate test. We give you that data, the 1 kilohertz sweep test. But realize, you know, when someone says, oh, our amplifier will deliver 200 watts a channel, all channel driven, and the seven, the seven channels. Well, 200 times 7 is 1,400 watts. If it's a Class AB amplifier and it's 50% efficient, that means you got to suck 2,800 watts out of a 15-amp line. Mm -hmm. 15 times 120, do the math, it doesn't equal 2,800. <laughs> so unless they're changing the laws of physics or they're doing something with superconductors, just realize the all-channels driven test is not a continuous test. It's an instantaneous sweep. Okay? And it has merit, but it's not the be-all, end-all. And there's a lot of fudging that goes on with amplifier measurements, just like with loudspeaker measurements, just like with any measurements mm -hmm. in any industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen it uh, way, done way too often, to be quite honest with you. What do you do in terms of, like, uh, to check for crosstalk in between channels, for example? Well, you know, again, this great audio precision does a lot of work for us. Mm -hmm. It has an all-to-one measurement for crosstalk. and It's really cool because it'll look at one channel at a time, and it'll drive all the other channels to see what kind of ingress from those channels go into the, the DUT, the device under mm -hmm. test. And it'll automate it and do all the channels. So it'll do one channel at a time and give nice. you a graph. And it's really an important test, actually, with, especially with multi-channel amps. It tells you how the circuit layout has been done, how the wiring has been done. You know, we've had amplifiers that have had, you know, 70 to 80 dB of isolation at 20 kilohertz with all the channels. And then we've seen some amplifiers where it would vary, it would go minus 70 to minus 40, mm -hmm. or you would you would flesh out some of these issues. And the isolation between channels is important, especially for the front speakers. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people go to model blocks. And uh, I could see the merit because you have no crosstalk with model mm -hmm. blocks. And it's interesting because we have two model blocks here. We have the IQ audio model block. This little pint size amplifier really impressed us with the ability to deliver a lot of power in such a small package and it did it in four ohms too and it's a class d and this d sonic you know hugo you were told that this is one of the most powerful amps in the industry for sure for i sure. haven't measured it yet it, that's why it's here we're going to be putting it to the test we're going to be bringing out the we, big dogs we can't wait to go ahead and put it under test to be yes. quite honest with you it's another class d mm -hmm. and uh, you got to be careful when you measure class d amps because the switching noise can corrupt the measurement and give you false conclusions i've seen a lot of magazines measure class d amps and you see all this noise and they're talking about the noise and they don't realize that what they're doing is they're distorting the measurement inside the actual test gear. Yes. The test yes. gear is getting slew induced distortion from the switching noise and they don't know how to precondition. Mm -hmm. And again, it's all about understanding what you're measuring and if it's a practical to real world. And and the setup as well. I think if you don't go ahead and have the proper setup to test the amplifier, you're gonna go ahead and nullify your test result as well, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, we, we look at, like you said, we look at crosstalk, we look at signal and noise ratio, we look at um, frequency response, not only frequency response at one, eight, at one watt, but at full power, because some of the amplifiers at full power, they'll get slew-induced distortion, they'll be, you know, they won't behave uh, very linearly, mm -hmm. or they'll current limit at four ohms. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always good to see, to test a product to its limit, so you know how it will behave Absolutely. in the extremes. Yes.
That way, when you're actually using it on a real speaker load, you'll be able to assess how it's going to sound and how it's going to perform. Absolutely. You know, I think you covered a, a whole bunch of points. Thank you for covering them so thoroughly. I'm happy to do so. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is that one-dimensional testing may lead, and this is a completely different video, I think, but may lead to the idea that every amplifier, regardless of cost and design, <laughs> uh, will go ahead and sound the same. Oh my goodness, that generates such a heated debate on our forums and pretty much everywhere on the internet. And I <laughs> really think we should do a separate video. I think you should attach this video to that video. Yeah, that's what because I do, I think. This could be, uh, we could kill batteries on cameras with this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Anyways, with that said, uh, thank you so much for taking a look at this video. And we invite you to go ahead and visit us at audioholics.com where we have tons of great reviews on various products and tons of uh, information on myth busting, tons of myths out there in this industry. Oh, like. yes. And we also have a great newsletter we send out once a week and we invite you to sign up to it. And for signing up to our newsletter, you also get our top 2014 AV picks. Can you elaborate on this, Gene, please? Absolutely, Hugo. So what we did was we looked at all the uh, products in the industry, the ones that we actually spend time and hours, you know, doing an analysis and listening tests of. And these are budget-minded products and, you know, mid to, to low-level uh, price products that we thought really stood out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from amplifiers to receivers, speakers, subwoofers, you name it, the whole uh, kit and caboodles in there. Yeah. And it's a great guide if you're looking uh, for certain products at, at a certain price point, then we definitely recommend you take a look at this. Absolutely. Very, very complete. With that said, again, thank you so much for being with us. And up until next time, keep, keep listening. listening.